Burlington Select Board meeting for March 14, 2022. Can you please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> so before we start tonight's agenda, I just wanted to read a brief statement um, before we begin. After receiving eye-opening and informative feedback from several residents regarding the DEI update discussion at our meeting on February 28th, I'd like to make a few comments. Many of the emails and phone calls suggested that the select board offer an apology, apology to Dr. B.J. Addison Reed and the community, which I will do. Some of the comments inferred that members of this board aren't sensitive to issues regarding diversity, equity, inc and inclusion. For the record, I have been married to a woman of color for almost 34 years, and we're the parents of two biracial children. There have been numerous times when my family has been treated differently because of what they look like and because of their diverse ethnicity. I won't get into a lot of incidents, but some you can't ignore. I know what it feels like when your child comes home from the first day of middle school and asks if they're adopted because a teacher recognized the last name and said, I know Jimmy Tiggis, are you adopted? I also know what it feels like when your child's been called the N-word multiple times. With that being said, as chairman of the select board, I would like to publicly apologize to Dr. B.J. Addison Reed to anyone who was upset or angered by the discussion on February 28th, and to the community as, ho as a whole. My hope is that we can work together to make improvements and make progress in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion for all. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I looked at my state statement as well. Mr. Priest. Thank you. <clears throat> in the days and weeks since our last meeting, I've had some time to reflect. Dr. Addison Reed posed a question to the board that evening that certainly stuck, uh, struck a chord with me. Why did the board establish this DEI committee? <clears throat> it was pointed, and as one of the members who lobbied for this committee, maybe take stock in what was happening. At face value, we want to be working with the school district to ensure that inclusive and equitable efforts and practices are being brought forward, that the town is ensuring we talk the talk and walk the walk, that from race and gender to socioeconomic status, we are doing our best for every resident of this town. But over the last few weeks, I've begun to recognize that my own perspectives truly color the world around me, that I'm not as inclusive as, or, or equitable as I may have thought. That doesn't mean that I can't learn and grow. I need to broaden my ability to understand uh, the perspectives and experiences of others, that we all need to try to, to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. A good leader will listen, learn, and grow to better serve the community they, they represent. And from what we've been sent uh, from concerned residents to, to information I've seen from the state, there's an abundance of information that we can start with. Before moving on, I want to acknowledge not just the folks in the room Monday night who stood up to say something, but to everyone who took the time to write an email to the board. Residents just like us expressing their concern, dismay, and hurt. I want to thank each of you for speaking up. Um, while I've already spoken with uh, Dr. Addison Reed and apologized directly to her as well as the other members of the DEIC, I do firmly believe uh, that all of my talk needs to be put in some form of action. So I'd like to make uh, two recommendations, if I may. Certainly, Mr. Priest. Uh, the first of which is that all of the emails that we received uh, be placed into the minutes or the records that we have them uh, beyond just a public records request. Um, and the second is that uh, whatever form it takes, whether it be a special meeting or an ongoing conversation, uh, we join with uh, Dr. Addison Reed, Ray Porch, and anyone else in the community who's qualified to help provide resources and educational materials to the board so that we can continue this conversation in a fruitful and meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Priest. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I didn't formalize my, write, uh, my thoughts into writing, uh, but I've been thinking about them for the last couple of weeks. And uh, if I could take it back, I would. Uh, it wasn't my plan to go into that meeting um, and create a storm. Uh, I certainly apologize for it. Uh, I hope everyone accepts, and I mean everyone, not just Dr. Addison Reed. Uh, but uh, everyone uh, who was uh, offended uh, accepts the apology for, for what it is, and it's, it, it's a real apology. Um, and I, don't, I have to be honest, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about um, the things that people of color might think of. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean that 
who, you know, that night that that's who I am. So again, a third time, I apologize. Um, if I could take it back, I would. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll get moving with the agenda then. Uh, I'm, first item on the agenda is 429. It's an appointment to DPW, Mr. Sanchez. Good evening. So tonight I'm very excited to actually introduce uh, my recommendation for our water and sewer superintendent. But before that, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, many members of the department who are here today uh, supporting Matt, as Matt has developed great friendships in the department as he's a uh, real team player. So we have Tom Hayes, sound engineer here, Frank Anderson from Buildings and Cemeteries, Kevin Keane from the highway, Russ Makish, water manager of things in the back, as well as Richard Leonardo, our new business manager. We also have foreman, um, Aaron Chase is here, Jamie Fillion, who is filling as a foreman, Nicole Ronian, Mike Giardina, and our former employee, Don Price. So thank you for coming in tonight. And I will be remiss too if I don't mention uh, the people uh, here tonight from uh, Matt's family who welcome we welcome all here to this meeting tonight. So we have, uh, obviously, Matt is here with his wife, Kim, as well as his uh, two boys who are sitting right up front. His mom, Ellen, I'm glad you're here, as well as uh, uh, your sister, which I don't think I have met. <laughs> well, uh, you look just like him. <laughs> I should have known. And uh, Gary Garanti, who uh, is visiting from Cleveland, uh, Welcome, and thanks for coming in tonight as well. So it's a very exciting night uh, tonight to uh, actually have one of our superintendents uh, been uh, uh, promoted to a job, and in this case is following Paul Barron's retirement. So we, uh, as we traditionally do, we actually posted the position internally, uh, and uh, after reviewing of the requirements and qualifications of the job, I'm recommending Matt Davis for that job of water and sewer superintendent here in the town of Burlington. Now, Matt is a Burlington resident. Uh, he's been with us uh, for about 10 years, if I'm not mistaken, Matt. Uh, but prior to that, uh, Matt started working with the Winchester Water and Sewer Department, and that was in 2004, 2007. Uh, from there, he uh, went to Framingham, where they have a large water department, and he worked uh, in 2007 until he actually came in to work for here at the town of Burlington. Uh, over there he worked as a water technician, which is pretty much what he started doing here as well as doing some sewer work for us. Over the last 10 years, uh, Matt has been uh, taking charge of the different jobs that he had as he got promoted first from that uh, original entry level job, but we'll call it to uh, working foreman, most recently uh, lead foreman, and he has filled in also as water and sewer superintendent in many occasions. So Matt, uh, in those years here and prior to here, had accumulated a lot of experience in both water and sewer. He also holds a D3 water license, which is required for the job. He has hoisting licenses 1C, 2A, and all the four, which pretty much allows him to run any equipment that the town of Burlington operates. And he also has a CDL Class B license with tank endorsement. So I'm very, very happy to recommend Matt uh, for a promotion as a water and sewer superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Mr. Sagrino. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with John's recommendation, I wish to appoint Matt Davis to the position of water and sewer superintendent in the town of Burlington Public Works Department and ask that the board waive its 15-day waiting period. I'll move. Second. We moved and seconded to waive the 15-day waiting period. All those in favor? Aye. Who is abstaining? 5-0-0. Zero, zero. Congrats, Congratulations. Matt. Yeah. 
Yeah, Matt, uh, you want to come up front and get some, uh, grab some pictures with the selectmen as well? I'm good. Uh, I'm going to be on one. Who do you want to have? Mm -hmm. They're going to get it along. Get some money. Okay, uh, before we move on to the next next agenda item, uh, Mr. Runyon. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as excited we are as we are for uh, for Matt and his family here tonight, I just wanted to also thank uh, Paul Barron for all his years of service with the town. I think it was close to, uh, to get almost 40 years with us, didn't he, John, Paul Barron? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Uh, he, uh, and he uh, worked his way up as well mm -hmm. from uh, labor all the way to highway and so, uh, service to water and sewer superintendent. So. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, I wanted to thank uh, Paul for his, uh, his time here and wish him nothing but the best in his uh, retirement years. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. Today. Okay, item uh, 430, residential pickup of textiles. Uh, Mr. Sanchez. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, could we pause just for a moment? Certainly. Good morning, you too. Thank you. Thank you. The only way we get, we get a good, good tennis. <laughs> Over the back of the meetings, there's <laughs> have an audience. All right. Okay, Mr. Sanchez, you're up at 4:30, 4 3:00. So uh, thank you. Uh, so tonight um, we're here because I'm introducing uh, what I hope to be a new partnership with a company that will um, pick up textiles from our residents. Uh, and before I get into that, uh, there are a couple of items that may be of uh, importance to our residents as well as to the board. So last year in October, the Mass DEP came up with their 2030 uh, Solid Waste Master Plan. The Master Plan sets goals to... Hold on, we got music playing here. Yeah, so this, they set goals to uh, where they believe the state should be by 2030 in waste reduction as well as 2050. Um, and, and I use those words carefully as far as goals versus mandates. So those are goals that the state has set to uh, help both businesses and residences uh, reduce their waste. And that includes not only our waste that we currently produce, but also requiring um, policies that would eliminate products and packaging and uh, going all the way to uh, items that may be recyclable from the get-go, compostable, or reusable. Uh, we all know there's a lot of waste and packaging and things of that nature coming forward. So uh, they, re they reviewed the plan, like I said last year, and they introduced those goals for reductions over the next 10 years, as well to uh, by 2050. So the statewide reduction that they set up as a goal is 30% uh, on this decade. Now, along with setting up goals, they also introduced new items that uh, they will mandate uh, to be banned from our waste stream. 
Uh, one of them is uh, textiles and the other one is mattresses. So we'll talk about mattresses at a later time. We're working on uh, a process to be able to offer the residents a place where they can uh, dispose of mattresses. Uh, in fact, Grecia Leonardo is working on that, um, actually coordinating a regional uh, program, uh, eight towns, I believe. Uh, so we'll talk that at a later date. We have an RFP open right now, and we're going to be working with the other communities as well, and hopefully we'll be able to have answers in the next couple of months uh, for the select board. But tonight we'll talk about textiles. So the new ban uh, is for anything that, uh, as the name implies, is textiles, whether it is clothing uh, and things of that nature will be also banned starting in November of 2022. So uh, trying to get ahead of it, we uh, coordinated with a couple of vendors uh, to see which vendor will offer the most benefit to our residents. And tonight we are recommending that the board approves uh, a memorandum of agreement with CMRK Textiles. And uh, the agreement was reviewed by town council. Uh, and I believe you got a copy of it in your packet as well. Uh, what they will be uh, offering to remove uh, from our residences or pick up includes items such as clothing, shoes, sneakers, blankets, purses, back uh, backpacks, uh, hats, gloves, etc. They will also remove by appointment items, small items such as vases, picture frames, small musical instruments, and things like that. Now, all of this will have to be uh, by appointment as opposed to the last time that we came here a few years ago, which it was an automated, you put it out with your trash, this will have to be done by appointment. Uh, but we believe that this company is probably the one that is offering us the most into our residence, and that's why we, at this point, recommended that uh, we approve this agreement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sanchez. Mr. Runyon, you have any questions or comments? Oh, on this? yes, I, I have, actually. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you clarified um, mandates versus goals and so on and so forth. But some of these mandates, EPA, DEP, et cetera, uh, PFAS is a great example um, that offer no assistance to uh, the communities when they, when they set these goals and mandates and so forth. So this kind of, this is somewhat like that pink bag uh, program we had there a few years ago. You put it out and it kind of worked fairly well for a little while and then sort of petered out for whatever, for whatever reason. So the, the, the business model they had, it was a little complicated. I mean, they, they actually, uh, in that particular company, was offering to drive the entire town, every street, whether or not anybody had anything out. Yeah. So uh, that requires a lot of energy and, and effort, and sometimes people will not put any items out for, for, for collection. So this is similar to it, but this one requires you to call, make an appointment, and they will know which homes they have to go on. Yeah, and similar the to the, the, the white goods and the heavy Correct. Correct. So that we still call the public for refrigerators and yes, like that, right? yeah, that has not changed. So as far as the bulky items, uh, whether it is a couch or a chair or desk, or whether it is a refrigerator or a stove or anything like that, you still call uh, Republic. Don't forget that residents can call anybody who they actually please. I mean, this is a, a service that some of it we offer free of charge, some of it they have to pay for. Uh, but uh, particularly the items that they pay for, they, they have the option to utilize uh, whichever company they, they desire. But yes, yeah, similar to that, they will have to make a call and make an appointment. Okay, so, and then just, just given the, the difficulties we've had um, in the last couple of years with uh, uh, pickup in general, the odd waste in particular, we've had this discussion a few years ago about should we maybe start thinking about a municipal type of uh, facility here uh, somewhere in town. I don't know if you think it's time for us to maybe uh, rehash uh, those discussions or? So the timing is really good. You're, you're correct about it. I mean, we have another um, about a year and a half left in the contract that we have. So, uh, so there are a couple of ideas that have been floated, which I think that we should think about going forward and how to manage and not just uh, that type of waste, but also our recyclables. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the way we're doing it right now is the most efficient and cost-effective way that we may have. So yeah, this is the time right now that we start thinking about it and come up with a new proposal for the next contract. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Randy. Mr. Randy? Yeah. 
Mr. Chair, a couple of questions. Chris, real quick, how are we going to uh, go about getting this out to the residents? What are we, what's our uh, game plan as usual to reverse 911 calls, letters? Um, so we, we probably uh, wouldn't do a reverse 911. We try to keep those for just uh, uh, real big issues and emergencies, but we certainly will do social media, website, uh, newspaper press releases, uh, and things of that nature as well. Uh, and um, it, plus, we will include it, if I may, Joe, I'm sorry to interrupt. We will include it in our uh, new calendar that we sent out in uh, June. So if when you read it, this information will be there so they know who to call, which number, et cetera. Well, one of the reasons why I said the 911 call, because I was trying to get to another point that if they're not signed up for it, they don't get it. So that's part of why I brought the 911 call up, because if a resident's not signed up for that, then they don't get that reverse call for whatever emergency is. Uh, secondly, uh, does this company have, any, will have anything to do with the dumpsters outside, or are we still going to go forward with our plan on this? So this is totally, this is totally, uh, you're talking about cardboard dumpsters? Cardboard, yeah. No, this is totally unrelated to that, but one thing that we may sure off as we talk to different companies is there are other vendors that require us to have their own containers located on town property in addition to having the regular pickup, and we decided not to do that with any of the companies. We've seen what happens with those containers, like other companies put out at different places and what people do um, when they're full. So uh, we, we're not adding any new cans of containers to this. So people have to put their stuff out in a bag or whatever it's gonna be. In front of the homes. In front of the home, and then there'll be a designated time, just like they do now with refrigerators or couches or whatever's out there, just a different telephone number for them to call for that particular stuff. That is correct. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Mr. Priest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a funny feeling Joe's going to bring up the, the, the dumpsters. So that's why I was <laughs> grinning from ear to ear. Um, you know, this is this is great. First off, I, I think the program's great. Um, these these types of things are a dependent on the residents, right? Like for this to be a, a functional and good program, the residents have to bag this stuff and make the call. And I, I know that I'm saying this for people who are watching, right? Uh, because if they just keep throwing their stuff in the garbage, it's just going to keep winding up in landfills and being misprocessed or, you know, low, you know garbage loads are going to get, it's just, it's a complete mess. Um, so, you know, I'm asking residents, like, when you hear about programs like this, take advantage of them because they're there to help the overall process, right? Like, your, your use of your waste is one particular moment in the life cycle of this, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff upstream that needs to happen to reduce waste and a whole bunch of stuff downstream needs to happen to, to reduce waste. This is just our, our role in it. And we need to you know, do our best to parse these things out so that way when it gets to where it needs to go, it can be taken. I mean, how many times in the last couple of years have we talked about you know, loads of garbage being turned away uh, you know, because it wasn't either clean enough or right enough or you know, th there was too much st stuff mixed into the recycling. It's just, you know, it's a mess um, and it's only gonna get worse. So. The more that we can do in our homes, um, you know, to parse our waste, to reduce our waste, the better off the overall process is going to be until the process, the upstream and downstream get adjusted as well. So I'm just using this opportunity to say to other residents, like, the, the more we can play our part, the better off I think it's going to be because then we'll also be showing action taking place. So, John, thank you for this. I, I think it's a good program and I'll certainly be using it as, I, as my kids throw things away. <laughs> if, they can, if they can open them. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, um, in, in our house, even our grandson is a monitor and keeps an eye on us to make sure that things go where they're supposed to when they're going out the door. Um, John, I know this doesn't start till November 1st. Um, is, how long is the, the period going to be to determine if it's working? Uh, no, our plan, uh, the ban starts November 1st, but we're going to start this right away. Oh, okay, good. All right. So, so and uh, we have clauses in the contract that we can, uh, if we don't feel it's working the way it should be, we can actually cancel uh, the contract with a little bit of notice. Uh, so we, we'll let it go a few months, see how it's doing. Uh, and it's, as you recall, we actually ended up canceling the last contract because it wasn't working as well as it was supposed to be. So and what... I'm sorry if I might, but what does it mean it's not working or it is working? So when, when the residents uh, are told that you're going to be there Tuesday to pick up whatever you put out and, and now it's Tuesday the following week and it's still there and of course we received the phone calls. Um, 
uh, which we should, and then we'll know by monitoring how many of those we're getting and whether or not the items are picked up when they're supposed to. We know, you know, at that point we'll determine whether or not it's working. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holden. John, just two quick things. One, with regards to what Joe said about notifying the residents, maybe the tax bills, you could put something in the tax bills. So, so we, we could, uh, typically uh, we use our water bills for additional um, information to our <coughs> residents as well. Right. And, and we, we find it easier because the tax bills, I think they already hit. There's a cost, by the way, of how much you add to an envelope, uh, which is why we don't use the tax bills because they already use they do scholarships and other things, but we, we do the water bills because we can add. Oh, that's fine. Well, yeah. Water bills are good. The other question I have, a little, a little bit of a concern is, there's a term in here that says uh, on the MOU is uh, t clothing, textiles, and small household items. <clears throat> that's a very vague term, so I don't know if people would take liberty with that and consider, throw certain things out that they consider a small household item. So remember, they have to make, uh, if I may, they have to make that appointment uh, before the item gets picked up. Uh, that's what the contract says, but, oh, thank you, I was looking for that page. <laughs> but there's actually, uh, we're going to be publishing this, uh, so, so it's defined, I don't know if the camera is up, but at least you can see it. It defines exactly what they can do and what they're allowed to do. And this may get modified as time goes on, um, so, uh, so it's a very limited list of items that they will pick up. And again, depending on, on whether or not there are issues, then the list will get modified. Right. I, just, I just wanted to avoid that issue of ambiguity and say, you know, it's a small household item, why aren't you taking it, you know? But other than that, good idea, I, I agree with the others as well. So uh, we need to, I think, I think we have to take two motions on this one because I think we're going to ask <clears throat> Mr. Sagarino to sign on this one. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this agreement's been reviewed by town council, and as part of your approval, if you could just authorize me to sign the agreement, I would appreciate it. So we could, uh, I'll be looking for one motion uh, to approve that also allows for Mr. Sagarino to sign the MOU. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Five zero zero. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, fourth, item 431 is the snow and ice deficit. Would you just identify yourself for the record, please? Sure. I am Rachel Leonardo, DPW business manager. <coughs> okay, so I'm here to request authorization to deficit spend our snow and ice account by $500,000. Um, thus far, we've had a pretty clunky year. Uh, we've had about 48 inches of snow. Normally our average for a full season is 56 inches. We've had 18 events and normally we have 14. And so far we spent about $650,000 and our yearly average is $670,000. Um, a big impact this year is that our four major storms were on Fridays at the end of the work week. So that's a big driver this year. Um, that it? That's, That's it. it. Um, I'll start with this, Mr. Hogan. No, I, I'm okay, but um, like I try to do on a regular basis, for those people who are watching who don't understand what the deficit spending is, could John take two minutes or? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Yeah. Just give us a very short explanation of what the deficit spending is. Uh, so every year we budget only $350,000 for snow and ice. That's a comfortable low. We never want to spend under $350,000 because if we do, that money is lost. We cannot reallocate that money anywhere else because it is specifically for snow and ice removal. So we would rather overspend and go into this deficit every year so we don't have to lose that money. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. Mr. Priest? Not for me, thank you. Mr. Randy? No. Mr. Runyon? Um, no, I mean, this is anticipated. This is uh, actually an annual uh, disbursement. So Mr. Sag no problem. Mr. Sagarino? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to point out that we budget for this deficit every single year, so uh, Mr. Denisio has already accounted for it at the beginning of the year. As Rachel indicated, uh, it's very common for communities to keep their snow and ice budgets artificially low, uh, understanding that we can spend more if we need to to clear the roads. So, But along the way, we're budgeting for... Uh, the amount we truly spend every year uh, within both fiscal year's budgets. Thank you, Mr. Sagarino. 
All right, uh, looking like there's nothing else. I'll be looking for a motion to approve the uh, snow and ice deficit. I'll make a motion to approve the snow uh, deficit. Five. Second. Moved and seconded. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Five zero zero. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Item four thirty two. Approval of the uh, Hearn Family Charitable Foundation. Mr. Hearn. Good evening. If you could just introduce yourself and give us a brief synopsis of the event. Uh, Bob Hearn, the president of the Hearn Family Charitable Foundation. Um, we're a five hundred one c three organization that. Um, promotes and, and uh, supports veterans and military families. This is actually our 20th year in operation. And each year we hold a St. Patrick's Day Gala uh, and raise money for a couple of organizations. Um, every, it, they're different every year. This year it's the Fisher House Boston and the New England Center and Home for Veterans. Um, we hope to give each, each one of those organizations anywhere between 10 and $15,000 uh, a piece. Um, that being said, uh, this Saturday, March 19th, we're holding again our St. Patrick's Day Gala at the Burlington Marriott. Uh, we have been um, fortunate enough to have MS Walker uh, support the event in lieu of donated liquor for our VIP reception uh, for our, uh, our um, supporters, but our uh, special supporters that, that um, donate large amounts of money. Our sponsors, thank you, I just found it in the back of my head. Um, and uh, that's why I'm here, one of the reasons why I'm here tonight is to see if I can get approval for a one day liquor license and also extended hours uh, for a post VIP reception as well for those sponsors from uh, 12 to 2 a.m. Thank you, Mr. Hurt. Um, this will require, this is three separate items, so we'll require three Separate votes. The first would be uh, Mr. Sagarino. Did you yeah, I just wanted to point out that the license, is, uh, the Marriott is a licensed facility, and what makes this uh, request unique is the donation of the wine to the event. Uh, so that's what we'll be approving essentially this evening, Correct. aside from the change in the hours. Right, and we, I know we've had this event before so several times. It's just we have to do this because of the donation aspect. So we need three separate approvals. Um, I'll just go through them, and then I'll have someone make a motion. The first approval is going to be for uh, the charity wine license for the Ahern Family Charitable Foundation. The second approval is going to be uh, is an approval for accepting the charity alcohol, and the third approval is the extension of the closing hours. So, do I have a motion on the first? Uh, we ask a couple questions first. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Marindi, I'm sorry. So I have it here when it is and stuff. But could you tell the residents when it is, or is it a private event, or is it? No, it's public. We, we uh, uh, social media, um, newspaper, all that good stuff. Okay, and how would the residents go about finding out about it? If they can, they go online. Is there? A well, unfortunately, we're sold out. Okay, but but they can find out about our foundation. Yes, they can, uh, find, they can also find out if there's a way to donate without even being at the event. Yes, sir. At that, at that event. Um, and how many years you've been doing this now? Twenty. It's our twentieth year. I knew that. I just wanted residents. <laughs> No, I think it's a great event, and I think that uh, you're a charitable person for doing this kind of stuff. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Marini. Mr. Rangan? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, can I offer a fourth uh, uh, item to the, to the, to the an amendment to your, your items and ask that the board waive the $75 fee um, for the special license? Can I uh, ask town council, uh, can we amend an agenda item like that? You, you can. It's an amendment to the existing motion, so you can do that. So that'll be a fourth approval, or a fourth request, correct? Would it, would yes. it be a, an amendment to the first request? Right, I would say oh, it's, uh, it's uh, an amendment to the first request uh, to, to grant the charity wine license and waive the fee. Okay, excellent. Uh, Mr. Any, are you, anything else, Mr. Ringy? Mr. Mr. Priest? Uh, no, I, I support the fee waiver. Okay. Mr. Hogan. Yeah, thank you for your service. Thank you. First of all. Um, and could I ask a favor? Sure. Um, could you give us a little more lead time? I mean, yes. four or five days of something. If we were to lose a piece of paper in that short time, we wouldn't want to screw this up. Absolutely, that's our bad. And I apologize for that. Okay. Uh, I know things get things get a little bit confusing. I'm sure you had a few things on your mind. Just a bit, just a bit. But again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I have well, no At this point, Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to uh, for the number one total charity wine license for a Heard Family Charitable Foundation with the amendment of the $75 fee being waived. Okay, that's been 
Motion has been made. I'll second it. It's been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Five zero zero. Make okay. a motion to approve acceptable charity alcohol. Second. Second by Mr. Hogan. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Five zero zero. I'd like to make another motion to extend the uh, hours of closing till two a.m. You said? Two a.m. Yes, sir. Till two a.m. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Five zero zero. You're all set, Mr. Hearn. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. Okay, item 433 on the agenda is approval of a common victuals license of Bennett's Sandwich Shop. I assume someone's from, oh, Brendan from Bennett's is on, uh, on uh, Webex. Webex. Brendan, Brendan, can you give us a little uh, update on this item? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the board. It's an honor to be here and to be serving Bennett sandwiches to the great community of uh, Burlington. Um, we're a fam family owned and operated uh, establishment, um, have locations in Kennebunk, uh, Maine, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, the Fenway neighborhood of Boston, and uh, are really excited and honored to be uh, in Burlington. Okay. Um, anybody on the board have a... Michael, I'll start with you. Do you have any questions for? Uh, I would, you know, I was in Kenny Bunk over the weekend. I didn't see your signature shop up there, but <laughs> thank you. Well, we're actually uh, we're, we're seasonal in Kenny Bunk, so we been towards the end of Maine uh, and closed down around Labor Day. Um, but uh, we're perhaps the busiest establishment in Kenny Bunk, so uh, so definitely uh, if you're up there over the summer, please visit us. We'll do. Thank you, Mr. Morandi. East. Uh, no, thank you. Okay, so no, I'm good. Chair is that either. So, uh, with that being said, for approval uh, for Karma Victor's license for Bennett Sandwich Shop, 75 and the 6 Turnpike. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Abstain? 500. Zero, zero. Congratulations. Hey, thank you very much, everybody. We look forward to serving you. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, I'm 434. It's been canceled. Uh, the event has been canceled. So we'll go to item 435. It's a, a continued public hearing on the all alcohol Del Frisco's closure update. Mr. Sagarino. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've been in contact with the attorneys for this transaction and they're not quite ready to go yet. Uh, so they've asked for a continuance till uh, April 11th uh, on or after six o'clock, please. Okay, I'll be looking for a motion to continue this public hearing. I can motion to continue the public hearing until <coughs> April 11th. April 11th. On or after 6 p.m. Okay, is there a second? Yeah. Moving and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Continue to April 11th, 2022, on or after 6 p.m. Okay, item 436 is a presentation on the MBTA Housing Choice uh, Program. Attorney <coughs> Meade. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, Ms. I'll go to Mr. Sagarino first. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. I can just say a few words. Uh, some new legislation at the state level. Uh, there are some requirements that are going to be put on the town over the over the next uh, year or two, and we're going to have to work together as a team to meet these requirements uh, as we move forward. And uh, to that end, this is the first step in the process, and uh, we've invited uh, members of the land use boards here to participate in this with us this evening. Uh, we also have our planning director, Kristen Kastner, and our economic development director, uh, Melissa Tatakos, are both in the uh, Zoom meeting as well. And we have our town council here, uh, Lisa Mead, to give us the presentation on, on what this legislation means for Burlington. Lisa, I apologize. I missed my own note that said go to Paul first. That's uh, Val, I'll turn it over to you. I'm happy to be preceded by Paul anytime. <laughs> Um, so thank you, uh, Chair and members of the board, for um, having me here and all the land use committees and folks that have had decided to attend. As Paul indicated, uh, in 2020, uh, the legislature passed a new piece of legislation. Uh, the first requirement is that we do a presentation to this board about the requirements and guidelines. So um, that's what we're here to do tonight. Uh, Kristen Kasner is going to participate in this presentation. I want to thank Kristen and Liz for helping to put together a number of the slides toward the end relative to how this actually applies specifically to your land area and what the um, what the impacts might be. Um. So we're going to have an introduction and purpose. We're going to talk to you about the timeline, talk to you about why Burlington is an MBTA community, the summary of the guidelines, what are the requirements for the town, and what happens if there is non-compliance. 
So as I said earlier, um, in 2020, a new piece of legislation was added, Section 3A of Chapter 40A of the uh, general laws, um, which is the Zoning Act, which requires communities to adopt multifamily housing zoning. Um, I just want to add here that as part of that same legislation, Section 9 was amended, uh, which goes to how we adopt zoning related to multifamily housing and accessory dwelling units. We're not talking about that tonight, but it was part of the same legislation, uh, which we can will probably be discussing closer to town meeting because it affects some of the articles of town meeting. Uh, this act, section 3A of chapter 40A, requires that an MBTA community shall requires have at least one zoning district of reasonable size in which multifamily housing is permitted as of right and meets other criteria set forth in the statute. It requires a minimum gross density of 15 units per acre, not more than a half a mile from a commuter rail station, subway station, ferry terminal, or bus station, if that's applicable. We're gonna talk a little bit about how that applies to Burlington, because you have none of those. Um, the purpose is to encourage MBTA communities to adopt zoning districts where multifamily housing is permitted as of right. And you're gonna hear that over and over in this presentation, um, because that's new for many communities. So uh, the timeline is this, the first public comment period um, on the draft guidelines, which have been out for about a month and a half now, is um, due at the end of March, March 31st. And so um, the town thought it was important to have this presentation now before the draft guidelines were finalized to help aid the town in providing any comments the town wanted to make to um, DHCD and EOEA relative to the guidelines. Then an MBTA community must take the following action by 5 p.m. on May 2nd. Include a presentation of the draft guidelines in a meeting to the select board. That's what we're doing tonight. Complete and submit the MBTA community information form, which um, is a very simple form that says we're doing this tonight. Um, and then uh, submit updated GIS parcel maps. That doesn't apply to Burlington. There's actually only a few communities in the Commonwealth that are in the MBTA area that need to update the GIS maps, but Burlington's are up to date. So doing this and submitting the form by the first part of May is what the first step you're required to do. And we'll get over that hump tonight. Uh, the next time is by December 31st of this year, um, a community must submit a request for determination of full compliance. So if the community did a review and decided they were actually already in full compliance, you have, you have as of right zoning that allows multifamily at this density, then you'd be done at the end of the year. Um, so you would see if you had full compliance. Uh, Burlington won't be in full compliance by then, uh, as are most communities, but that is an option. Uh, you would have to notify DHCD that there's no existing compliant multifamily housing and submit a proposed action plan by a certain deadline, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So that's more likely that's going to be Burlington's um, job is that we'll say we're not in compliance, but we're going to have an action plan. And for bus service communities, which is what Burlington is, uh, the, action plan, the action plan has to be submitted by March 1st of 2023. So just under a year, we have to have an action plan submitted. Uh, and then the multifamily zoning district adoption deadline is December 31st of 2023. So by the end of this year, we're going to say we're not in compliance. And by March of next year, you're going to have an action plan in place. And then by the end of the year, you actually have to have adopted the zoning. So if you think about the town meeting process and the hearings necessary to go through that process, it's actually a pretty tight time frame to adopt some pretty significant zoning. And then after that, the community has to submit a request for determination of compliance to DHCD within 90 days of adopting the zoning amendments. So if you were to adopt the zoning amendments in the September town meeting next year, for example, within 90 days of that, you would have to submit that form to DHCD. So, um, so what is Burlington as an MBTA community? You are a bus service community, which means an MBTA community with a bus station within its borders or within a half mile of its borders or an MBTA bus stop within its borders 
and no subway station or commuter rail station within its border or within a half mile. So you have bus stops. And in Burlington, you have, that means your minimum multifamily district unit capacity requirement would be 2,086 units. So I just wanted you to see also specifically the statute um, because it, it goes to the, the requirements of these units. So first of all, the district has to be reasonable size in which your multifamily housing is permitted by right. Talk to you in a minute about what reasonable size means. It means that the unit is with the units are without age restriction and are suitable for families with children. Reasonable size means it has a minimum density of 15 units per acre and then subject to limitations on wetlands and things of that nature and not located within more than a half mile from the commuter rail station, subway station, ferry terminal, or bus station, if that's applicable. So reasonable size is relative, not absolute. So if the town were to submit something that was close, so let's say you couldn't have a section that's less than five acres, but it was 4.8, and you had reason for that, DHC might permit that but they're likely not to permit something that's just an acre. So there's a reasonable size. It's not an absolute determination, but it's been pretty clear to everybody that they're gonna pretty much stick to these guidelines. DHCD will take into consideration both the area of the district and the district's multifamily unit capacity. That is the number of units that can be developed as of right within the district. Multifamily districts should not be a single development site, but must comprise at least 50 acres of land or approximately one tenth of the land area within a half mile of the transit station. So it doesn't have to be 50 acres in total. I mean, excuse me, for one parcel, but in total, it needs to be 50 acres. You can use an overlay district to comply. At least one portion of the overlay must include at least 25 contiguous acres of land and no portion less than five contiguous acres will count toward the minimum size requirements. Multifamily districts should be in areas that have safe and convenient access to transit stations for pedestrians and bicyclists to the maximum extent feasible. So let's talk about the minimum unit capacity. So, the minimum multifamily unit capacity that you must provide an accurate assessment of the number of multifamily housing units that can be developed as of right within the district referred to as the district's unit capacity and the capacity must be equal to or greater than the specified percentage of the total number of housing units within the community. Okay, so we've already said what that is. It's just over 2004, the town of Burlington, 2086. Um, so we don't need to go into the calculation, but essentially when you look at the calculation, if you decide what your land areas are, you take, you say it's called a gross unit capacity because you can take into consideration roads and streets, but you can't take into consideration things like wetlands or hazardous waste sites. So if, or deed restricted properties. So if you had a parcel of five, five acres, two and a half of which was deed restricted somehow, that wouldn't count. You go to the next slide. And I, I would reiterate here again that the Commonwealth is very clear that they're not requiring you to create housing. They're requiring you to create zoning, which allows housing to be created. And I think that's a, a pretty big difference. So what is as of right? As of right means without the need to obtain any discretionary permit or approval. It does allow for site plan review which is true site plan review, which the town of Burlington has, and it may be required for multifamily uses, allowed as of right to ensure public safety and convenience, regulated vehicular access and circulation on site, architectural design of buildings and screenings of adjacent properties. It can, the conditions cannot make a project infeasible or impractical. So I'm, I'm gonna go in to have as of right housing by a certain density on a certain square footage of area, I can still, the town can still require that to go through site plan review. 
the site plan review board here, the planning board would not be permitted to put conditions on that, which, which would not make it feasible, but it would still be an as of right review to allow site plan review. I would add here that, and as we go through that, um, you can make conditions in the zoning, much like in a 40 R district that requires thing, certain amount of parking, of course, design requirements, so that if a person came in with an ad, as of right proposal, it, it, it did meet certain requirements that the town had short of a special permit. It just sets them out in the zoning. Here's what they clearly are. Go through site plan review and you can get your as of right permit. So it's not like you just have to say it's as of right and you get to go build whatever you want to build. You do get to do some parameters around like around that like you would any other zoning. Um, so the multifamily housing is without age restriction and shall be suitable for families with children. Um, DHCD will deem a multifamily district to comply so long as it doesn't require the multifamily uses to include um, units with age restrictions and does not put limits on the restrictions on the size of the units, the number of bedrooms, or the size of bedrooms or number of occupants. So let me talk a little bit about what reasonable size is. So it means have a minimum gross density of 15 units per acre, subject to any other limitations, as I said, under 4031 in Title V, um, and under hazardous material, under the hazardous waste laws. This district must have a minimum gross density of 15 units per acre. And Kristen's going to show you some examples of that that already exists, so you can get an idea of what that means for density that you already have in town. Um, not just individual parcels, but gross density. So you might have some in the district which have more densely populated than others, and you might have some areas in the district that might be a little bit under the 15 units per acre, so long as the average over the entire district is 15 units per acre. Um, as you can have sub-districts within the multifamily district to comply with this requirement with different density requirements, as I said, so long as the gross density meets the statutory requirement. I might also add here that um, multifamily means three units and above, right? So you might have districts that are appropriate for triplexes, right? Condominiums or triplexes, or ones that are multi-story multifamily buildings. So there's a whole mix that you can do, but not single or two. You have to um, take into consideration the far following when you are calculating uh, the density, the limitations on development resulting from inadequate water or wastewater infrastructure, and in areas not served by public sewer, applicable limitations on Title V. Uh, title restrictions, as I said earlier, that might exist of record, and physical limitations uh, caused by the presence of water bodies and wetlands. So the town does have to do some digging, no pun intended, when they look into this to determine whether the land areas they're including are actually developable. It has to be located no more than a half a mile from a commuter rail station, subway station, ferry terminal, or bus station, if that's applicable. So this is one area that we're gonna look, try to see more um, guidance um, in our comment letter to DHCD. And Kristen's going to talk a little bit about that because, of course, you don't have any of those specific items or locations in town. You have bus stops, which are a contiguous, I mean, a continuous line, right, as opposed to one station. So um, we're not really sure how that's going to apply yet, but generally speaking, the distance from a transit station is measured from the boundary of any parcel of land owned by the public entity and used for purposes related to transit. Uh, for a community that has a transit station within its boundaries, then the location has to be within a half mile. Um, where there is no land within a half mile of the transit station that's appropriate for development, um, it's so long, it has to be created so long as it's easily accessible. Now, I'm going to give you a sample of this. We, you know, we go back and forth. I live in Newburyport. We're an MBTA community. We have a commuter rail right in town. The town of Raleigh has a commuter rail station, right? It's in the middle of the salt marsh. There's no developable land around that. And so their, their town rally is required just there. The minimum number of units you're required to allow created in your zoning is 750 units. 
Um, so they're going to have to, to figure out a reasonable location that provides easy access to the transit, but is obviously not within a half mile of it. So those are the balances that communities are going to have to start to think about. Um, here, we have to figure out exactly what that half mile means, which is the clarification we're going to be seeking. Um, and the last bullet, they do talk, if feasible, the area, if you don't have a station, um, then it has to be reasonable access to a transit station based upon existing street patterns, pedestrian connection, and bicycle lanes uh, to be consistent with sustainable development principles. So we're gonna, we need to get more clarification on that. So again, what are our requirements here? Submit comments to the guidelines, uh, if any, by March 31st, 2022. Present draft guidelines to the select board, complete and submit the MBTA community information form and submit GIS updated <clears throat> parcels if we need to by May 2nd of this year. Submit a determination of full compliance if applicable by December 31st of this year. <laughs> a proposed action plan by March 1st, 2023, and adopt multifamily zoning district by December 31st, 2023. Uh, and then, of course, submit the determination within 90 days to DHCD. I will say that because of the adoption of 40A Section 9, the amendments, these multifamily districts will be adopted at town meeting by simple majority vote, not your typical two thirds. What happens if you don't comply? So you will lose and become ineligible for funding related to your housing choice grants, local capital fund project uh, funding. Does anybody know what that is? Are you right here? That's actually the funding that comes from gambling revenue. Um, and so far, it's, it's really interesting discussion about where that money goes. Um, there, it has been appropriated in the past, uh, and it's up to the legislature and the, and the governor, um, but they are supposed to fund local capital fund projects. So you wouldn't be eligible for that. Uh, and Ma the mass works infrastructure program, you would not be eligible for, uh, and then DHCD may in its discretion, take non compliance into consideration when making other discretionary grant awards, um, and indicate that penalties be may be more severe in the future. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen. Ms. Castle. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Good evening to everyone. Um, good presentation up to this point. So what I'm going to talk about is really more Burlington specific, kind of what we're looking at, what some, what are some of the things that we need to be taking into consideration as we continue to think about this. So just um, this highlights what this slide is, is a listing of the multifamily housing developments in Burlington that do have um, a density of 15 units an acre or more. Um, and that is it. As you can see, some of them are assisted living, some of them are, um, you know, older, newer. Um, but what we can, what we glean from this calculation is that none of them today are by right and a handful of them, a handful of them are not even currently allowed in the zoning district they sit. So none of these um, none of the existing um, house, housing stock that meets the density would comply with the rest of the, the regulations. Um, and then just quickly that if you add all this up together, we're looking at um, about 45 acres of property. So next slide, please. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, Wait, you want to, I think you skipped it. Can you go back one? I did, but it didn't. There you go. There you go. Um, yes, my slide is different than. John, made a stop. Nope. Um, I. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. The, this is not marked up the way that I had sent over earlier. Um, there's anyways. a hot Kristen. There's the next one's a highlighted 1. The next 1 is yeah, um, let's go to this 1 and then we'll go back uh, if we need to. Um, so what this, this slide is, is a, um. Is just highlighting the, uh, age restricted. Oh. Anyway, sorry, uh, this slide is highlighting the age restricted units. Um, 
the ones in yellow, like deep yellow, sunshine yellow are definitely age restricted. Heritage at Stone Ridge is partially age restricted. There's 36 units of um, of the 180 that are that are age restricted there. So just to highlight that these would not count um, for that reason. Next slide, please. If, if I could, Kristen, one moment, if you go back to the slide before, that's the ex example of um, the 15 units of acre or more. Yes. Um, so yep, so these are all, as I said before, these are all 15 units um, an acre or more, but I kind of described that in the, in the slide before that, so okay. we can continue. Um, and then we get into the reasonable size calculations where, and I'll go into it a little bit more, but I think, you know, D, DHDD saying that, well, they have discretion here, but then having these hard numbers of 5, 25, and 50. Um, so even further, this list, um, and this, this list here takes out all of those age restricted, uh, and then further narrows it down to um, take, taking out projects that are on property less than five acres. Next slide, please. Um, so just to graphically understand where we are, so um, our existing bus routes are shown here. I know this is not meant to be really a slide to be read, but just kind of understood spatially where things are. Um, we have the MBTA bus route 350, 351, 352, and 354. Um, for the most part, they hug the southern um, kind of southern bit of Burlington with the exception of um, up through Cambridge Street. If you look at the MOV parcels, those are existing multifamily units that are 15 units or above, and they do relatively sit um, along those routes. Um, as Lisa mentioned, we don't have, quote, a bus station, so we don't have that point where you draw a convenient circle around. What we can assume, but don't know, and this is certainly a, a question that we're putting in our comment letter, is if we don't have a point, does that assume that the bus lines, you're drawing a half mile from those lines themselves? Um, so that's a question we have. Next slide. Um, so what does this mean for Burlington? Um, so we have done a good job creating multifamily. Currently um, in Burlington, we have about 33% of our housing stock as multifamily. So the what Lisa was mentioning before, the 20% number at a little over 2,000, that that's 20% of your housing stock should be multifamily. We in Burlington have 33%. Also, um, we have been doing a good job of keeping pace. If you look at the the table um, below the assessor's data num numbers, that in the 70s and 80s, we built multifamily housing in the 2000 um, and 2010s. And even now, we've, we've, we have done a very good job keeping pace and have been building multi housing throughout other than the 90s. Um, so we do meet the target percentage. Um, I mean, that's one of many numbers that we have to really be looking at. Um, we do not meet other requirements in the guidelines, such as the reasonable size district of a minimum of 25. Beacon Village is the closest at 22.7 acres. Um, and we do not allow anything by right. Um, and then I mentioned before the do we assume the half mile corridor. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is again just to remind everyone where we are. Um, so comments are due March 31st. Um, I am drafting a letter, um, which we um, circulating around before the 31st. Um, if anyone has any comments after this presentation, we certainly want to um, uh, open it up to folks to send comments to planning at Burlington.org if you have comments. Um, and certainly always call our office, um, the planning department office. Um, so that's underway. The um, actions before May 2nd, we are looking in the complete and submit the um, community information page. That's really a lot of the information I just presented. Um, what do you have? Where is it? Does it meet the all these different requirements? And, uh, and as Lisa mentioned, updated GIS is all set. Next slide, please. Um, again, these are so with this. Um, as we map out, what do we need to be thinking about um, between the end of this year, between March 1st, 2023, uh, and then, of course, the action that we need to take before December 31st, 2023. Next slide, please. 
Um, so as mentioned, these are kind of the beginnings of the comments that we have reasonable size. Burlington's housing stock is very much a ton of single family and a bunch of projects that are over 200 plus units. Um, when we did the master plan, there was a heavy discussion on the need to diversify our housing stock, infill housing, finding different um, smaller scale unit types um, between townhouse, but also more senior friendly design of um, fl the flat kind of living, which we have actually done a pretty good job of moving that forward. Um, but with the five acre minimum, it's kind of discouraging those smaller projects that are super hard to get funded in the market anyway. So it's just another way of why wouldn't we be really looking at more infill downtown, other other types of projects. So I just, in general, think that we want to comment with the five acre minimum and to the 25 acre single district parcel. Um, I don't know. The, the legislation says reasonable size, I guess. Overall, I think it's going to differ in each community and kind of where our existing planning has gone um, when public um, public comment discussion um, and master plan in ter terms of our housing policy and goals. And I know the housing partnership is doing a um, undertaking a housing um, needs assessment right now, and they'll be weighing in on um, some housing um, policy as we move forward in Burlington, but just um, certainly. I don't know, I guess just that reasonable size where they may accept it if, but really it, how do we know if it's, if it is going to be accepted? So the half mile requirement, not from a defined point, as I mentioned before, and then the determination of developable land um, puts a huge burden on communities in terms of having to do a parcel by parcel assessment of developable options within the boundaries of the districts that we choose. So um, I know I've talked to others, but really pushing the um, the state to kind of consider how how are communities going to be able to do this? I mean, we in Burlington, we we do have a good amount of professional staff, but we're also the professional staff we have is you know very overwhelmed with what we already have going on. So this is just kind of a, the a highlight into some of the comments that we're looking at is in terms of you know we understand we want to create housing within our communities, but there's just um, you know, how we go about that and with or without assistance from the state. Um, and also infrastructure needs, I think, needs to be more heavily considered um, in terms of what we can build. Um, or I, and as Lisa said, it's not build, but develop. It's not a production statute, but it's a maybe you can. Um, so it's a little bit unclear on some of those guidelines that we're, we're looking for some clarification um, before they finalize the, the guidelines to moving forward. Next slide, please. Um, so what we do need to do, we know of the three things in the statute is reasonable size. Again, need clarification on that. 15 units per acre is in the statute. 15 units an acre will be always here. And the other is the distance from the bus, bus route, bus station, um, as well as the no age restrictions and, you know, family friendly housing types. Um, we need to look at and understand more about existing housing areas and how much that plays into the number in the quote production number. Does it all have to be new? Um, what about existing um, existing areas that we could produce potentially more in certain areas within those existing areas? Um, and then evaluate new areas that we may be considering for housing options um, by right. And that we need to do this by really by the end of the year, I think the statute and the guidelines are a little bit unclear and Lisa, I feel free to chime in, but you know, it says must be completed by March 1st, 2023, but in the guidelines, it says must be approved by DHCD on March 1st, 2023. So, which is it? Um, so, and then again, we need to revise the zoning by December 31st, 2023. I mean, we're lucky that we have three town meetings a year, but, um, Anyway, I mean, overall, Burlington is in a much better position than a lot of communities that I've talked to um, about where they're going to go with this. I mean, as Lisa mentioned, with Rowley and the Salt Marsh, and you know, barely professional staff to do it. So, um, anyway, I, I think the message here. I think I, I don't think it's oh my goodness, how are we going to do this? Is I think we can be strategic about it, um, and I think we will be able to meet the 
whatever exact guidelines will be in the future. But I, I, I do think there's a path forward. Um, I don't think we're going to be in a position where we're going to have to forego um, very important infrastructure funding that we have proven to need over the last couple of years and actually have done a very good job um, working toward getting. So, um, so anyway, that's all I have um, at this point. And I think Lisa and I will probably be open for questions. Um, Right. Thank you. So I do, uh, sorry, one other thing I, I will say that um, you, you don't have to create it new, um, but it has to be by right. So, um, so that's, that's the rub, right? So <clears throat> as you saw in that first um, chart from Kristen, you have all of this great multifamily housing, uh, but none of it's by right. So you would have to change those districts if they qualified to be by right. Then you'd have to take out the age restriction, right? And I'll make sure that it was sufficient for families with children. So those units that were there that were age restricted couldn't count. You could turn the district over to be by right. So there's some, I think there's some things that you can do with that. I don't, there's no clear path right now. I think there's gonna be a lot of communication with DHCD as we're developing the zoning moving forward or doing the plan that to show the action plan to show that what you currently have um, but you can use you can use existing zoning and existing housing if they meet the criteria. Um, if you were able to do that and submit it on December first, December first of this year, and prove that you met it, then you'd be done. Um, but most communities are not going to be able to do that. Thank you, Lisa. So we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, Kristen, thank you for that presentation as well, uh, Mr. Hogan. Uh, Lisa, a couple of times during your presentation, you talked about the need to uh, get some clarification on some things. Do you foresee any situation where the timetable is going to come and go and not getting that clarification is going to cause any problems? Um, I think that we have to proceed in the current timeframes. I suspect that DHCD will try to turn these guidelines around pretty quickly after they receive public comment because they don't want to back off on any of the timeframes. Um, so I'm hopeful that they will do, you know, they'll give us the time necessary or give us the answers quickly. They have been pretty responsive to date and have done a ton of outreach to, um, to the municipalities, to administration, through, uh, through the regional planning agencies, they're doing a lot of outreach. So I'm hopeful that they will be as engaged moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. Uh, Mr. Priest. Um, Nothing right now. So, Randy, there's a million of them. I just don't know when I'm going to ask them all. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. Uh, I just I don't even know where to start. There's a lot there, a lot of time frames. A lot of this seems to do with the planning board. Um, I think they're just looking for an approval from us to not tonight, but to approve this to move forward, right? So all we you don't need to take any votes tonight. Yeah. We just need to have made this presentation to you about what's required. Right. That's all that we need to do. Your approvals moving forward are going to be, you know, actually the board is not required to approve anything. These are zoning amendments. So their town meeting and planning board and zoning bylaw review committee and land use board, but this board won't have to approve anything except for the submissions. Probably looking into the future of it all, seeing that these communities that you say age restriction. What about the ones that are fifty-five and older? That those go away? Those no, no. Those um, so those are age restricted. Obviously, um, they don't have to go away. Nobody, nobody's making those go away. But if you have an age restricted multifamily housing unit, it can't count towards this requirement. So there's a new project going up with a piano store. Is right now there's one going in over there. I don't know what they, they they want like a hundred units, but that's probably not going to happen. But that would help us out at some point if it was seventy five or whatever. Six um, or what. if, if it already went through permitting, it permitted special permit, so it's not by right. Okay. So that doesn't it wouldn't count. By right, that's right. That's a key word. I did write that. By right. By right. That's, yeah. No. That's one there. Okay. So that's a project, um, Lisa, that is going through um, proposed uh, proposed zoning amendment right now. Okay. That is it? only on three and a half acres. Is proposed to be by right, but that gets to the kind of reasonable size question. Okay. Yeah, these are just comments more than they yeah. are questions for me. I just like I said, um, uh, in here somewhere, uh, two thousand and eighty six. Mm -hmm. How close are we to that? 
So uh, as Kristen, and Kristen can answer this a little bit, but as Kristen showed in her um, chart, you actually, of that 2086, um, I don't know that you have any that qualify. Is that right, Kristen? So we don't have any that qualify because there, nothing right. is by right um, and or not even allowed in the zoning district. So um, we have, we do have 33% of the housing stock is multifamily three units or more. Um, it's just to, to Lisa's point, what we have doesn't meet the other aspects of the criteria. But, and that's why I was mentioning that, you know, we do have 33%, they're looking to make sure our, our community has 20%, but of, of all of those 33%, they don't meet the other aspects of the criteria that's required. So and that's to, one of those things we need to look at and review. So to end, to actually piggyback on the, the age restriction question. So when I talked about deed restrictions, that was one of the things. So if you laid a by right zoning overlay district over, you know, 200 age restricted units right now that went in by special permit, but you've overlaid a by right district on it, it still wouldn't count because you have a deed restriction to the over 55 requirement. But Lisa, on the you know on the on the contrary of that, you could have a existing meaning that you like if you had Beacon Village that's existing. If we made the RG zoning district a by right zoning district that met all of those other criteria, those units could count. But, but so I'm not familiar. Is the age restricted? No. 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 Okay, so that's correct. So we're really talking about a lot of planning board issues and then the town meeting issues. Correct. Coming in front of us, there's really not that much coming in front of us just that we all want to understand this. Yeah, you're definitely going to want to, because eventually, let's think about it, may infrastructure improvements may have to eventually come in front of you, things like that. Right. Okay. But not, okay. but only when it starts to get built. So one more question. Um, the town center, uh, the, the overlay, how big is that area from, from the high school to, where is that to 25 acres or is it too narrow for the 25 acres they were talking about earlier? The town center in total is 127 acres, which obviously some of which is um, a lot of town owned property. Okay. All right, just just curious. I didn't know how big that was. All right, thank you. I didn't know, Mr. Segrino, I was just going to say, uh, Melissa has her hands up, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, Melissa, let me, just, let me just get to Mr. Runyon first and then I'll get to you, Michael. Oh, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Lisa. You touched on accessory dwelling units at the get you. Beginning of your remarks, and I'm going to circle back to that at a later date. So the public comment period, okay, we're having this this meeting tonight. Is is uh, do we have a, a way for people between now and the end of the month who can't attend tonight or may not be, have time to get their questions? Do we have something in place for people to be able to participate? Sure, they could just reach out to select board office or the planning board office, uh, you know, whatever they're, they're most familiar with, send us an email and uh, we'll take uh, all the comments into consideration. Good. So you also mentioned um, under the new um, legislation, let's just take, for example, the Beacon Village that uh, Kristen alluded to earlier. If part of our solution was to uh, go to town meeting and say, we want to make this property uh, a by right property. That would require a vote of town meeting, uh, just a simple majority, is that correct? It would be, a, well, so I, I'm not familiar with the proposal. Is this a zoning change that we're talking about for the fall, I mean, for the May town meeting? So if it's multifamily and it's a, either in a town center or near transit, and there's a definition for that, or a densely populated area, then it's a simple, so that's just like, I'm just, this is a big ex explanation without seeing that area. It would be a simple majority vote at town meeting. Yeah, I'm not even sure. I, that might've been a bad example, because I don't know that if it's within half a mile of uh, the, the transit. But it also can be a town center. Uh, it's a little bit on the outskirts of town, but, uh, and, um, my, there, yeah, that one may or may not, but I think that's a lot of what the clarifying questions that we're trying to figure out. And um, and finally, I know there's going to be a lot of questions, so let me I'll just, let me wrap it up here. You mentioned uh, 40R. 
some of your comments earlier. How does that differ? Because I think that's got some connection to MBTA as well. Right, but it's but it's not exactly what we're talking about. Right, so General Law Chapter 40R is the original smart growth zoning that was passed by, I believe Governor Romney was in office, I think, when it was passed. Um, and the town would have to adopt that. And a 40R zoning is um, near transit, uh, reuse of a, of a dilapidated site, like an old hazardous mill site, old, old uh, industrial site. Um, or one that the uh, DHCD found, finds appropriate. So there's three standards for a 40R site. 40R sites can be um, also be mixed use, and 40R is much like what they're requiring here. Um, it's design review, and it's not a special permit. Uh, and you are required to have under 40R at least 10% affordable units, and then they go up. Um, so there is an affordability requirement, and there is also a density requirement uh, in a 40R district. This zoning does not require any affordability requirement. You would rely on your town's inclusionary zoning requirements to accomplish that um, in these developments. But otherwise, uh, 40R requires an affordability requirement where this does not. Okay, terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, Michael. Well, listen, I'll get to you in one second. I just want to finish with the board and. I actually have a couple of questions. This applies to us because we have buses running through Burlington, correct? That's correct. Um, to follow up on what Mike's point was, if we, and Melissa, this is probably, um, I'm sorry, but uh, Kristen, this is better for you, a better question for you. If there, we were able to rezone certain areas like um, Beacon Village or any other area to be in, in uh, by right, district, is there any way that we could get a theoretical estimate of how many units we would have if we were to redistrict this complex, that complex? Is, is that a possibility? So that's, and that's why it was directly pointed out in the slide of kind of next steps. Um, I think it's a twofold approach. What do we have? Look at that existing zoning. Do we want to modify existing zoning for existing um, housing that is and create that already exists to be to meet all of these requirements. But I I don't think there's any scenario where we look at existing housing stock and only do that and it meets everything. I think we're going to have to have a twofold approach where it's a balance of um, areas of existing housing that the zoning does not meet these requirements that we could modify, coupled with an identification of some new areas that we look at as well. All right, thank you, because that was my what, what point I was trying to get at is if we can rezone as much as much of the current, as many as the current complexes that we have, that's less that we have to create because we've already rezoned it. But with regards to Beacon Village, here's my other question. If now I think there's an MBTA line, a bus line in Woolburn that's within a half mile of Beacon Village. Can that be used? to satisfy one criteria. Um, uh, go on, go on, Lisa. No, you're more familiar with the geography, so go ahead. Um, so I would say, you know, half a mile from a bus station, I would say it should be considered. It's, um, it's a good question. And I think, um, you know, we're looking, as I mentioned, we don't have that single point. So we have those lines and what are kind of the areas around those lines. And one of the exercises that we need to do is map that kind of those mile corridors on each side of the um those bus lines so um i think that's a very good question and i think it should be considered um and it's one of, it's a, something that we'll be clarifying in the letter but that half mile doesn't have to be in your town it just has to be any right so we're right we're at, barlington's a bus stop community um not an adjacent community but to kristen's point um it doesn't make sense that if you're allowing it within a half mile of the community that has the bus station and then there's a an adjacent community that's also within a half mile of that bus station, you should, you should count it. It meets the same goal, so long as the bus station is easily to get, is easy and direct to get to. So those are the kinds of things that during that, the year process, trying to figure out what counts and what doesn't count, that we need to be getting confirmation from DHCD, yes, this would count, even though it's in a different community, so that we can check that box and try to reuse, if you will, the existing multifamily housing that would count and then understand how you'd have to create more. Thank you. 
Because I think if that's the case, I think Kimball, Kimball Towers may qualify as well, because they're right on the moving line. Uh, anything more from the board before I go to Melissa? No. All right, Melissa to Douglas. You're up. Um, thank you. Uh, I guess for the record, Melissa to talk with economic development. Um, I think part of, you know, how I see some of the MBTA, um, new regs is really to help us think about how to be, um, a little bit more transient oriented, transient, transit oriented development wise and thinking as we kind of continue to, you know, grow and shape the development that's, you know, coming to our town. Um, one thing to think about, you know, is, you know, exactly that. What what areas do we have that would currently qualify? Um, but also, where can we leverage this development? I think, you know, one thing that's been talked about um, is mixed use. A buy right area with residential and commercial is also would qualify um, if the residential is um, buy right. So it's that's something to you know think about. Um, and I guess also, you know, the rules, you know, as Kristen and Lisa have emphasized, they're still forming. So they're looking for our input. So all these questions that we're pulling from this meeting need to go in a written form so that we can really document that so that when they do create these rules, um, you know, communities like ours, you know, is very much heard, like our voice is heard. And I just, I guess want to emphasize that there, we're looking for clarification, but we're also telling them what we'd like to see in these new rules as they kind of finalize things. And I feel like that's kind of important as we kind of move forward. A couple other things that, you know, I think have been talked about in different areas, you know, the corridors, um, our bus, you know, our bus corridors are important. Um, the North Suburban Planning Council has identified the mall, for example, as a mobility hub. And that area has, you know, not only a couple of bus lines going in, but it has, you know, some alternative modes of um, transportation. And it's just interesting to think of how we can leverage some of our existing commercial environments um, to think about potential infill, whether it's small. Um, and this is kind of the thinking we've been doing around the mall road and Middlesex Turnpike initiative. Um, there's a nice, you know, compliment, if you will, if we can kind of harness um, some of the development potential that, you know, or de development demand um, that's occurring here along 128 um, and use it to guide it to how we want, want to see it. And I think it almost complements well with the MBTA um, regs here, MBTA communities. Um, so those are a couple of thoughts that I had, you know, as we're talking about this. Thank you, Melissa. Um, anything further on the presentation? Or oh, the question is from the audience. So, um, just a second. Do we take audience questions? Pardon me, uh, audience yeah, questions? Or? Yeah, please. Okay. Anybody in the room that wants to talk or ask a question about this agenda item? None. Okay, seeing none. Anybody on WebEx that wants to uh, ask a question uh, regarding this uh, item? John Isla. Uh, John Isla. Mr. Isla, go ahead. Ah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, John Isla, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 6. I uh, had a, a question and a suggestion. Uh, so the question I had was, uh, I. I, it seemed a little inconsistent. I, I heard that we have 3,748 multifamily housing units currently. That's 33% of the stock. Uh, so that was one data point. Uh, but the other data point that seemed inconsistent is the, the spreadsheet you were showing with our current multifamily housing, it only added up to 1,200. So I'm, I'm trying to understand the discrepancy between those two. Or were they counting different things or? So this, um, so I can answer that question. So the spreadsheet was narrowed down to only those units that were 15 units an acre or more. The multifamily 20% is anything three units or above. So there's a lot, there's a much longer spreadsheet with um, a lot more information um, and projects on it. The spreadsheet that we were showing was really because the statute says 15 units, we know that is an unchanged criteria within um, 
the MBTA community's requirements. So therefore, that's why we wanted to pull those out and highlight that those projects, while they meet that 15 units an acre, they don't meet all the other criteria for you know a number of different reasons. Got it. Okay, that that explains it. The density was too low on those. Okay, so I I guess what what I would suggest. My understanding is, you know, the way the law is written. Uh, and or at least as it's presented here, and it, from what I've seen is written, it it is uh, uh, not quite vague, but it, it's not highly specified. It's giving terms saying you know it has to be reasonable and so on. And, and all these numbers, like the 15 units per acre, the 25 acre you know minimum for at least one part of it, and so on, are coming from the DHCD guidelines. Uh, so, I, my assumption is that means, you know, it, that means with our feedback, we could suggest changes to those guidelines still uh, by the end of the month. Uh, so, uh, I, I guess what I would suggest is, it, given it, you know, their goal is ostensibly to create more housing through this multifamily mechanism, uh, I, I would suggest that we uh recommend changes to the guidelines that uh make it a little bit easier for us to count uh, a large fraction of what we have already uh so I, I you know i would suggest that uh you know one uh we get them to reduce the guideline for the uh single you know at least one parcel of 25 acres they get that reduced to 20 so that beacon village would uh you know we could work that in would uh, easier changes, and the the other suggestion I would say is if you uh, you know just to pick a number if if you're you know fifty percent above the requirement so to speak uh, you know where our requirement is twenty percent you know if, if the community is significantly above that and you know we can you know figure out what the right number is but if the community is significantly above that that uh some relaxed guidelines would apply and you know again we would uh you know suggest relaxing various guidelines that would be advantageous to counting more of what we have uh because i, I think the point is we're you know we're contributing our fair share of housing we should get credit for that uh you know the fact that we built it well before uh it was a requirement shouldn't be held against us uh you know we don't have the large undeveloped tracts of land that other towns may have, you know, with, with their five acres zoning or whatever, uh, where they have this flexibility to to throw in a bunch of things. So so I, I guess I, I would suggest we take advantage of the comment period to make suggestions to get the guidelines a little more in line with accepting what we have. Um, so that that's the suggestion. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I just uh, I just want to throw one clarification out there. The actually the only number that is in the statute is 15 units per acre. So that's that's not gonna change as Kristen said earlier. The rest, we certainly can push back on as John suggested. Great, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on WebEx that wants to discuss this item, the MBTA presentation? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Attorney Mead. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Melissa. Um, subcommittee reports. Uh, Ryan. Uh, no, sir, nothing tonight. Randy? Yes. Okay. I, uh, oh, thank you. The Hi. DPW, new building. Uh, Sanchez took me on a tour. Uh, building, it is absolutely beautiful. If you like dirt floors and steel um, going up and wires hanging all over the place, it's beautiful. It's not like new concrete. New concrete's coming in. Uh, what a great job they're doing down there. And it is big. It is big. It's beautiful. I love walking through it, seeing the. Uh, Progression take place. Long so, overdue. yeah, we're absolutely. These guys should be really happy when it's done. And I think it's right on track, right? We a little yes. bit yeah, on track. All the water will be cleaned up. It looks it did a great job. That's yeah. it. That's all I got. Mr. Priest? Uh, none tonight, thank you. Still, I'm good, thank you. And the chair has none either. Uh, Mr. Segrino with Town Administrator's Report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the one thing I wanted to update the board on was we received a letter from the state uh, just towards the end of last week. Uh, announcing to us that they will discontinue servicing us for the Sealer Awaits and Measures program. A oh. uh, little disappointed and a little surprised. Um, it was 
probably over 10 years ago that the state aggressively recruited us to be a part of their program. So uh, under the law, they're not required to, to do our um, sealing uh, services. So uh, John Denisio and I are going to be reviewing uh, various other options available to the town. And um, we've also spoken to Representative Gordon's office just to let him know, you know, we may need a little bit more time. Um, the letter specified that they wanted to wrap up on June 30th, which is a really short turnaround time. So we're going to have to push back on that a little bit. And some of the options we would consider is a, um, a private contractor, uh, possible partnership with another community, um, or something, something of that nature. Okay. Anything else? That's all I have. Okay. Mm. Uh, new business, old business, none of that. Uh, citizens time. I know we have a lot of people that want to talk on citizens time. We're going to start with the people in the room. Uh, again, this is citizen time is when a person, you know, citizen gets to say what they want to say, but it's not a negotiation discussion between the, the board and, and the person uh, making the comments. Because of, we see a lot of people that want to probably say something, we're going to have to limit this to probably two minutes a person, I would say, just to get your comment out there. And, um, so who wants in the room wants to go first? Who has, who's here for citizens time, I should say? Sherry, why don't you come up and just introduce yourself? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Sherry Ellis, resident. Mr. Moderator's over there. Yeah, well, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> one of them, one of those. Um, anyway, Sherry Ellis, uh, resident of Burlington, also a town meeting member. Um, and I wanted to follow up uh, on an agenda item that was discussed at the last um, select board meeting on February 28th, specifically agenda item 416, the uh, select board's DEI subcommittee report. And I, I want to acknowledge the um, comments from um, you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Mr. Hogan and Mr. Tigges this evening. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think uh, many people here or many people in the audience uh, were able to hear those comments. And I'm disheartened um, that a follow-up item uh, was not placed on the agenda um, for tonight. Regardless of whether there was to be a discussion on the matter tonight or at a future meeting, there should have been an agenda item posted to let residents know that the matter, that this matter is of importance to the board members. Discussing important matters such as this under subcommittee reports or old business or new business um, agenda items doesn't really give the residents reasonable knowledge of the matters that are gonna be discussed um, for tonight. Um, and that's something that the open meeting law is really um, trying to press and requires. Understanding that the agenda tonight was committed to a presentation, a very good presentation, thank you, um, a mention that it would be further discussed at a future meeting would have gone a long way to acknowledge the importance of this topic. Consideration and respect of the members of the board's own subcommittee, I believe, should be on the forefront of the select board members' minds. That being said, and not wanting to delve into the specifics of the matter, as it's late, and I will respect respectfully ask that an agenda item be placed on your next select board meeting of March 28th, in order that the members can address in some manner of action the decisions which the subcommittee requested from you in their two-page executive summary that was presented at the last meeting. And those include creating a philosophy statement for the community, determining definitions of the DEI-related terms, amending your mission statement to include references to responsibilities of all who reside in Burlington, and to lead negotiations for contracts to update and include language. Some sort of an action item should be in place. What you choose to do with those requests, I think you would want um, the residents of the town to know. I look forward to uh, the board's response to the report, um, and hopefully some of the uh, residents in town will um, watch the meeting on uh, recording. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Anybody else in this room, the meeting room, that wants to make a comment on the citizens' time? Seeing none, I'll... Uh, Put it out to the WebEx. Anybody out in the WebEx want to make a make comment, a comment on, this? on the citizens' time? Someone named Martin, Mr. Chairman. Okay, my, uh, the person whose the only name is showing is Martin. Can you please identify yourself? Yes, my name is Lois Smith Martin. I am a town meeting member from Precinct 7, and I just want to um, support Sherry Ellis's comments. Um, I think all that she said is valid, 
and should be considered. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Is that it? Um, who, who else? I don't see anyone else in the WebEx, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Nobody else for citizens time. Okay, in that case, I'll be looking for motion to adjourn. Yes, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. Meeting adjourned.